Good afternoon from Copenhagen. My name is Gretchen Karadimis. I work in the communications teams, team of the European Environment Agency. Welcome to Ask an Expert session. This time, actually, we'll be asking your questions to our Executive Director, Hans Bernings. So welcome, Hans. Thank you. Happy to be here. Today, we are going to actually talk a little bit about what has changed in the last 10 years in terms of the policy context that the agency has been operating, a little bit of your personal reflections on that kind of change and how the agency has evolved, what kind of knowledge needs, and any incoming questions from our live audience. So if you have questions for Hans, please put them in the LinkedIn chat and the team behind the scene actually will forward them and we'll be asking your questions to Hans. So welcome again. We started talking a little bit about the policy context. We live in a completely different policy world in Europe when it comes to environment and climate. What has changed? What would you say? Well, first of all, thanks for having this session and towards the end of my tenure mandate here. Uh, I would say that the policy context has been through what you could call a revolution, a paradigm shift. Uh, when I came in, I think it's fair to say that uh, under the Barroso Commission, but also under the Juncker Commission, yes, of course, Europe was building on environment and climate policies, but they were not really in the center of the policy project. It was about jobs and growth. Yeah, And then comes the Green Deal. and. Yeah, that has changed the whole context. It has brought environment, climate, sustainability issues to the core of the European model. And that means that uh, institutions connected to that core all of a sudden also play a role that we yeah, didn't like have agency. before, like the agency. And, and that was uh, surprising, not surprising as a response to scientific knowledge, because from a scientific perspective, we had been pleading for that type of approach for quite some time. But if you look at how quickly it changed from a context of, yeah, rather marginal attention for some of these issues to now central attention, it's flabbergasting. What was it? Was it the youth? Was it the result of elections? Was it some sort of awareness? What do you think triggered that? I think it was a combination of facts. Uh, I think definitely the, the youth movements uh, in 2018 and 19 played a role. And I know that because at the top of the European Commission, but also in the Parliament, people kept coming back to that. We need to be responsive to this young generation. The other thing is, of course, that science was increasingly clear about what we now call the triple planetary crisis, climate, biodiversity, loss, and pollution. IPCC reports were, were really clear, but also the biodiversity scientists were sending clear messages about the sixth great extinction. So the science was increasingly clear about this is the moment you need to act because it may be too late if it's not too late already. And that last part brings me to we were starting to see the impacts of climate change, for example, on Europe and in the rest of the world. It was starting to have serious impacts. We understood that we were vulnerable and we understood that we were dealing with costs. So we needed to respond. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you need a pol political context that allows you to make these changes. And I think the outcome of the European elections and the pressure also on the coalition formation around some key issues for this mandate of the Commission made it clear that these types of issues required more central attention. So it was a sort of perfect fitting of pieces of the puzzle together that allowed for the Green Deal to emerge. So actually, you did mention some of the UN reports and um, our flagship report, State of Europe's Environment Outlook uh, and uh, State and Outlook of Europe's Environment. Uh, you've published a couple of them. What would you say that in terms of the state of environment, compared to when you started at the agency almost 10 years ago and now, what has changed? Are we improving? You did mention some of the issues, but... Uh... Yeah, well, f first of all, let me emphasize that the European Green Deal explicitly mentions the state and outlook of the Environment Report 2020 as the knowledge base. So we did contribute to the formation of this ambitious and integrated policy package. If you look at purely at the state of the environment, European legislation has pushed member states towards improvements on some core issues like air quality, uh, where we did a, another briefing and report 
This week, air quality has improved under European legislation. We are protecting more biodiversity areas, uh, protected areas. We are also working on issues like waste and circular economy. So there is improvement. Uh, but the but is no longer we should do more and better, implement better. That is also true. But we started to understand that the systemic pressures on climate change, on biodiversity loss, on the use of resources on this planet were so fundamentally going in the wrong direction, connected to our core economic choices, that we had to come with policies which we now call systemic transitions, sustainability transitions. And when we came with that term as an agency in 2014, based on a whole community of scientists, it was regarded as a bit far-fetched. Yeah? Yeah. By now, everybody is talking about these systemic approaches and transitions. And they are needed because we understand that the issues, the state of the environment is what it is because we are dealing with serious challenges in our energy system, our food system, the way we move from A to B, our transport and mobility system, and also in how we build and construct things, our industrial and, and built environment. Yeah. You uh, highlighted the issues and I wanted to also say that we do have all these reports that look at these you know, systemic analysis. So we have actually not just published the state of Europe's environment, but also published uh, on the transport system, on the mobility system, on the food system, specific assessments as well, which could be relevant to our viewers. Just a quick reminder, if you do have questions for our executive director, Hans, please post them in the comments section. So we'll get to them uh, in a while. Of course, the knowledge needs have changed. So we do have these assessments that I mentioned. What do you think that kind of change uh, entailed for our work at the agency? Well, I, I think it's fair to say that a lot of the traditional environmental policies were rather fragmented. Air people worked on air and soil people on soil and waste on waste and water on water. And this whole challenge of moving core systems of our society in a fundamentally uh, different direction has meant that we are more and more connecting the dots. We are integrating knowledge and understanding what the drivers are of that, our mobility system and patterns that we have, our food system. And by integrating that knowledge, we not only create a better understanding of the state of the environment, but also we have a better chance of addressing the real issues with better solutions. On top of that, we have not only integrated more and more the environmental domain, but we've made more and more connections to sectoral policies, um, the, the transport policies in Europe, energy policies, but also to core elements of the system that we traditionally did not address, like the financial system. The Sustainable Finance Initiative in Europe is really fundamental. As an agency, we, we played a significant role in that. So those are new That's domains so yeah, and new, new integration of knowledge, which is leading to not only better understanding and connecting that to, to scientific advance, but also sending messages to policymakers that fragmented approaches to solve these issues are not going to work. And one of the issues, actually, part of the Euro European Green Deal is the transition, the social transition, leaving no one behind and stuff. And some of the work that we've been doing highlights inequalities. Can you say a few words about the social inequalities yeah. that we've been... I cannot emphasize the importance of this enough. Uh, I, I was so encouraged uh, that the European Green Deal, for the first time, made such a structural link between environment and climate challenges and social justice issues to just transition. That has not happened before. And it's challenging because, uh, yes, it's easy to say leave nobody behind. But if you dive into what that means and you really want to understand it, you need to bring knowledge that was produced in very different spheres of uh, science and, and agencies together. You need to bring policy approaches together. You need to start monitoring different things. And we've tried to do that. We are working with agencies in Europe that work on social issues and economic issues. We are coming up with uh, products like pretty soon an environment, health, and social distribution 
uh, Atlas uh, online on product third of May, actually. on the 3rd <laughs> of May, where you can connect all of these dots and it is delivering a sort of understanding about the social dimension and the other dimension. So it's one of the most encouraging parts of the, the Green Deal. And what is even more encouraging is that Europe is actually coming with financial instruments to support not only you know, what they are saying at the European level, but also a sort of push for countries at their level to make these connections much stronger. And thanks to the data the, and the knowledge that we did manage to bring together from the social economic aspects and environmental impacts and so on. So yes, European Health Environmental Health Atlas on 3rd of May. So you can see that on our website. A quick question, because also in your uh, time here that the agency has become more closely involved in Copernicus and the kind of data that you know Copernicus uh, offers us. Can you say a few words about what that means today and what it could mean in the future? Yes, well, data is uh, at the heart and, and soul of this agency. Yeah? So uh, we not only get a lot more data in the last 20 years, we are actively gathering 2,000 times more data, which is enormous. It's a tsunami of data. And that doesn't even include Copernicus, where we are talking about terabytes of data huh? that is more continuous, often more granular, that allows us to, to do all sorts of analysis. So the real challenge for me now is with all this data to produce not more noise, but better sound. Yeah? And that means we need to think about methodologies. We need to work together with other actors. We need to make careful choices of why, when, and how we will use the data. And Copernicus plays a critical role. Europe is spending billions, and rightly so, to put hardware around uh, in orbit around the planet. We now need to make sure that those investments do not only deliver better data, but they deliver better knowledge that can drive policymakers in the public sector, but also in the private sector towards deeper sustainability than we've had before. And it's fantastic as an agency to be one of the core players in this Copernicus program as what is called technically an entrusted entity. Huh? Yes, exactly, we are one of the uh, players. I can see we started getting some questions, but I just want to follow up on something that uh, um, we had mentioned a little bit earlier. So this was the state of Europe's environment. You did say it's not implementation only, but you know this kind of transition uh, yeah. that we need in key systems like mobility and food and so on. Looking ahead at the next 10 years, what would you say, what would you hope that European policymakers and citizens alike do to make that transition happen? Well, I would focus on two things. First of all, it's clear that the European Green Deal is now setting the goals and targets for 2030 as a stepping stone to 2050. Net zero, uh, z zero pollution, fully circular economy. The trend lines, the targets are there. I think it took a lot of political courage to formulate the European Green Deal. I think it will take even more courage to fully implement it because it will be profound changes. And so sticking to the implementation now that is required is going to be really important. And for me, the key element is that as Europe, we will be able to prove that as democratic countries with a rule of law system, where we base policies on knowledge and science and rational choices, that within this model, we can deliver the Green Deal. And that includes a strong social model, which is unique for Europe. It developed after World War II. It gave us uh, education that we have, uh, healthcare systems, social uh, nets uh, when people are difficult, have difficult times in life. Within that model, we need to be able to show that we can reach the type of sustainability that the Green Deal puts forward. That is for me the big challenge for uh, the next commission and then the next one and the next one and the next one. <laughs> it will because take That time, is yes. how it goes, yeah. Yes. But it does reflect on that, so the just yeah. transition component yeah. as well. So we have a question from Zia. So now we start taking some questions. Uh, she says, uh, thanks for organizing the talk. It is the social context and how to investigate the suitable governance arrangement to empower local actors 
and individual citizens to make energy con consumption choices at the municipal level that in turn support the overall macroeconomic and political climate objectives of the uh, yeah, well, the European I, Green yeah. Deal. I think there are several dimensions in that. And more the local level, I think a lot of these European policy targets need to be translated into national programs and very often also in a local context. 80% of European citizens live in cities, so that level is really important. Luckily, we see a lot of cities taking initiatives there. Right? We've got the, the 100 climate neutral cities under the mission on climate uh, adaptation and the mi mission on cities. So there is a lot happening at the local level. Can that be strengthened? Yes. But the other dimension here, which I, I hear and understand, is citizens, individuals. Yeah? I think this is critical. And we are often said you should be clearer to speak uh, to citizens, uh, also politicians clear when speaking to citizens. That is true. We need to uh, do that as good as we can. But I think increasingly we also need to speak with citizens. And why not uh, have the revolutionary idea to listen to citizens? <laughs> and although we speak to them, uh, and we luckily also there, we have really good practices in Europe. I mean, the, the citizen science projects around air quality in, in where people's kids go to school, where you engage with uh, teachers and, and students and pupils to build knowledge about your local environment and then bring that into you know, the practices that are needed or support systems on a local level to take poor households to get rid of their stoves based on coal and wood and, and bring them into cleaner energy, which creates a better indoor environment healthier lifestyles, better houses, better quality of life. There are so many ways in which we can engage with citizens and, and have them as core partners in these processes of positive change. Yeah. Um, I'll take some questions because there are questions coming um, Good. in. Uh, there's one question about what is the biggest environmental challenge we face. So if you were just to name one single one, is it climate change? Is it biodiversity uh, degradation loss? Um, so that's one. Uh, a second question is from Paolo Azzurro. Uh, he says, my sincere appreciation for the work carried out by you. The question is, is the EU going to adopt new consumption-based indicators for our work recently developed by the GRC, etc. It's a bit of a technical question, I, is, I understand. Well, let's do them one by one. Yes. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the biggest environmental challenge. Uh, look, it's not a matter of making a choice between climate or biodiversity or resource use. The biggest environmental challenge is at the core of our systems of production and consumption. That is our biggest environmental challenge. So we need, we need to work towards having 10 billion people on a planet, giving them a decent lifestyle. Yeah? And that means healthcare, housing, mobility access, good food, healthy food, decent, good infrastructure within planetary boundaries. And that brings you to the core of the issue. It brings you to our systems of production and consumption and to the inequality in the system and that is immediately the link to uh, Paulo's question on consumption-based footprints. And the answer there is yes. Uh, the JRC, Joint Research Center, is working on that. We are also doing uh, consumption work here. And yeah, we know that policies and data and knowledge is primarily based on the production side and the supply side of our economy. But we will not get there if we do not also ask questions about our consumption patterns yeah. and habits and how they contribute to the situation in which we are. Which also links to the citizen question, what can a yes. citizen can do? And, and, uh, and if I may, that is a really critical point for me because too often we are approached as consumers. Yeah. And I find that a really reductionist approach. I want to be approached as a citizen. I also consume as a citizen, we all do. But if you approach me as a citizen, I expect different things from my government, responsible companies, my municipality, within you know the, the context of making sustainable choices. If you reduce me to a consumer, you pretty much reduce me to uh, price signals. And, yes, and that is, that is not enough 
uh, if you want to really engage with me in this discussion. Yeah. Which actually is, uh, Nina has a question uh, for you. Uh, she says EA reports are fantastic. Is there a discussion on degrowth policies at the agency in the context of just transitions? and a uh, broader discussion of the effect of the environmental policies on the global community. So we've done some work on... Yes, I was, I was just going to say, we, we came with a publication that looks at debates that provide uh, alternatives for the traditional growth model, and that goes from sustainable growth yeah, um, to the degrowth model, to focusing away from uh, GDP as a, is now a big discussion also that is gaining a lot of political validity. The parliament is organizing in a couple of weeks a really big conference on that. So yes, we did uh, work on that and we also have published uh, work that links yeah, how do we organize ourselves as a society within the period that we now call the Anthropocene. And the Anthropocene pretty much sets boundary conditions on yeah, growth. And there is somebody once said uh, that uh, there are only two sorts of people who think that infinite growth on a finite planet is possible. And those are stupid people and economists. Yeah? Now, I, I, I disagree with the economists part because I think we're also starting to see a revolution in economics where well-being economics or planetary boundary economics, deep ecological uh, assumptions of economics are gaining traction in light of the, the challenges that we are facing. So yeah, it's it's a really valid question. Uh, before we get actually get to some maybe more personal questions about what is in the store for you after uh, the EEA, there's a very quick question from uh, Slobodan about uh, green public procurement. So actually, can public authorities uh, procurement can secure more demand? Um, how can we secure more demand from the yeah. public sector, he says, but I think it's on yeah. the rules. Okay. I, I, yes, I just yeah. said, uh, don't reduce me to being a consumer, but here mm -hmm. I will uh, yeah, I will link to Nike, just do it, you know. Uh, I th there have been enough trainings and handbooks and guidelines for green public procurement people know how to do it, we just don't do it enough. So just do it, yeah? It is possible. And those who engage in it are really, from a public procurement perspective, contributing to creating markets for a different type of services and products. And therefore, they are supporting those who should be the economic winners of the future. And so it's a strong call to anybody involved in procurement Go for it, just do it. Okay, very good. So a little bit more personal, we've yeah. got some more minutes. We can see if there are other questions that we can address. But, so you've been here almost 10 years. Yeah. What was your biggest surprise? Well, actually in those 10 years, my biggest surprise was how quickly we managed as a European system to move from one commission that didn't really have a strong green or environment or climate angle to the commission now, the von der Leyen commission, that is the champion of the European Green Deal. Uh, with of course, executive vice president Franz Timmermans, who is the, the torch bearer of, uh, of th that part of the commission work. But the speed at which that orientation shifted to me was really surprising and a positive surprise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And th that is despite COVID-19, that is despite yeah. the war, I would imagine. What did you enjoy the most in these 10 years? Well, <laughs> three things. First of all, I've worked with a phenomenal set of colleagues in the agency, but also in our networks, and that has been fantastic. Yeah. Secondly, um, I've had the chance to uh, visit and work with people in countries. We work with 38 countries. It's been an enormous uh, pleasure to do that. I mean, I've met so many motivated and interesting people and, and have a feeling that as an agency, we can contribute to, to something. And the third thing for me is very personal. I, I, you know, I came from academia as a professor, you have a learning attitude. I can say until today, I learn things in this agency with every report, with every indicator, 
with every assessment, with every meeting of a network, and it's been a fabulous learning experience. We are still getting some questions, so I want to be fair to our live viewers. Uh, before we go back to the few personal questions that we have uh, left, um, Bianca says, thank you for this talk and all the work of the EA. I would love to hear your opinion on hypothetically granting inspection powers to the EA to help the European Commission to, among other things, to monitor the state of implementation. So what would you, does that make sense? I would say no, and no for the following reason, that what we do is we bring together knowledge, trusted knowledge, and our partners uh, need to know that we use that knowledge to create the best possible understanding of where we are. That knowledge is then used by the European Commission in follow-up of policy implementation and if needed compliance uh, measures towards countries. Let's assume that we would also be the inspectorate and you're the French institution that needs to send us air quality data. You might be tempted to uh, send us data that uh, is not exactly, or you might put your monitoring station somewhere where that is not exactly. So the trust you need for the type of work we do is generally not only in Europe, but also in European countries separated from the inspectorate work, which is generally done by other institutions. I think that answers that question. Um, we have another question from Christopher. Uh, he says, much appreciated that you provide such a chat and uh, an observation about the fact that different policies are led by different uh, director generals of the European Commission. Um, but he says that disparity makes it quite difficult to develop future looking industrial strategies to help transform, I guess, the economy towards sustainability. Have you been dealing with industrial policy and do you have an opinion on that? We do actually work on industrial uh, Yeah, we work on, on industrial uh, emissions and industrial pollution, of course. Much of the work that we do brings back the state of the environment to the drivers, and the drivers are often uh, economic sectors, including industrial uh, sectors. We also work together quite intensely with the International Resource Panel, which has a strong focus also on the industrial side of uh, things. Now, I think it's obvious that the European Green Deal also has given an enormous push for Europe's reflection on what sort of industry do we want in Europe. If you add to that the horrific war in Ukraine, where we are now thinking about our vulnerability and dependence on external production, yeah, I think it's, it, and, and the investments now in the European economy stimulated by Europe in being a leader in green technology, uh, also in response to the American uh, initiative, uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA. I think it's clear that uh, the ambition is not to make Europe a green but industrial wasteland, but to make Europe a, a leader in green technology and the economy of the future. And that, that is an encouraging uh, push towards uh, our economic sectors. And it does take time for this, yes. these investments to bear results. Yeah. So we still have a few minutes. So if you have a question, last few, we can still ask uh, Hans. But I'll go back to the personal yeah. uh, bit. Of course, there have been so many things here since you uh, joined the agency. What achievement made you proud most? Well, um, I think that we have managed over 10 years to embed uh, environment and climate knowledge in a strong social economic context. We have become more policy relevant, I dare to say, uh, because we, we understood that this knowledge lands in a society that has economic sectors, that has investment priorities, that needs to set rules through policy processes, that has a strong social distribution dimension. And we have been translating our knowledge in a much more policy-oriented uh, set of publications and, and indicators. 
because policymakers, in my experience, they don't think in micrograms and ppms. They don't think in histograms. They don't think in probability charts or R squares. They think in societal terms. And so I think I'm proud that this agency has taken this growing body of knowledge and has managed to really enter into societal and policy debates in a more effective way. And we see that uh, through the places where we are invited, through the partners that we work with, and through, I would say, also the impact that our work has on European policy formation. Maybe the last question from our live audience, again from Pablo, uh, who is asking about uh, COPs, climate COPs. Yeah. If you have any suggestions to reform or to improve the COP process uh, to ensure that it delivers expected results. Yes, you have been on yes, many calls. Yeah, yes, <laughs> Paolo, yes, I do have them, but I, I suggest that, that we have a couple of beers or a good <laughs> bottle of wine over that because I cannot answer that in in yeah. one or two, uh, or th the key approach to Europe there is twofold. One, we are ambitious ourselves, and two, we are a trusted partner. Yeah. And I think that that sort of approach from a European perspective is important, but there are so many other ways. But uh, yeah, L when we ever meet, Paolo, uh, I'm happy to sit down with you and have a couple of beers. But I think maybe the, the, the point is, yes, Europe, Europe is a leader, but it needs to be a global discussion. Yeah. And at this point, whatever the process is, that is the platform that yeah. uh, we have globally. And Europe is trying to make a um, difference. Yeah. So back at the personal uh, bit, so if you had a personal message to our live viewers, what would you say? Like, Well, my, my message is a, is a broader message. Um, I think Europe is often criticized for all sorts of things. And, and having been in the system for 10 years, I, I can understand some of the criticism. And, and yes, we need to improve. But uh, I think we should be much clearer in our understanding and also our our, our framing of the fact that we live on a unique continent. Yeah. Um, we live in a rule of law system. We have a social system that takes care of people who are struggling in life. We have a system that values knowledge and that allows people from all walks of life to enter into science and into university. And I think we have to preserve that. And when I speak to broader audience and they crit are critical of Europe, I say, yeah, you're right there. You can critique a lot. But let me ask you one question. Yeah. Name me one other region where 10 democracies are each other's neighbor. Yeah. There is no other region. So we live in a unique continent with a unique history. And we have an opportunity to work together with 27 countries and a number of others that are motivated by our project, Iceland, Switzerland, uh, Norway to work together uh, on this unique project that is called European integration and that has a strong vision towards the future. And understanding that that is unique and valuing it, and uh, I would almost say on a daily basis, is what drives me and motivates me and what I hope uh, people will do in Europe. There's one last question, and this will be the last one we take from uh, our live audience before we um, uh, close this session. Uh, Alexis is saying thank you for your time. Um, how would you see the way to keep the worldwide competition? You did mention uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, mm. and, uh, and there's also a discussion about carbon tax as well in Europe. Uh, knowing that fulfilling environmental policy on a short term required investments, public and private, I guess, requires yeah. uh, investments. Well, first of all, the answer is in the question. If we look at it as investments, we know that they will bring benefits. Too often I hear it's costly. Mm -hmm. Well, I make a difference between a cost and an investment. I think we are, yes, we are investing, but we're already investing a lot in our economy. So it's not necessarily always about finding more and additional money. And by the way, those in the financial sector say there is no shortage of money. There is a shortage of direction in it's where we put the money. So uh, yeah, by putting uh, putting the money within a, in a certain direction and by taking all of our investments and giving, giving them a sense of direction. Mm -hmm. 
think that is the most important thing. Both private and public. Of course, public. yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the last question, uh, what will you do after 1st of June? Any uh, interesting, exciting plans? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I First of all, I, I will continue a little bit of what I'm doing now. I will remain active in the International Resource Panel and work on the Global Resource Outlook, the Global Report that will uh, be published in 24 at UNEA. Uh, happy to continue uh, that with great colleagues. Uh, secondly, I will go back to academia and teach uh, European environment and climate policies and sustainability transitions at the university part-time. And thirdly, in my private life, I uh, will be volunteering uh, for the Special Olympic Movement, which is the Olympic Movement for people with uh, intellectual disabilities, because I'm very committed to that cause. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hans. Uh, I'd like to thank all our viewers as well for your questions and for your engagement. We'll be back with other uh, Ask an Expert sessions. Um, if I can say so, the air quality package that we recently, actually this week, earlier this week published, as well as our uh, pesticides assessment also published this week. So keep watching this space and thank you again.